All right. It was awesome. Thank you guys so much for uh, those of you who served and sacrificed on Friday and Saturday and then all day on Sunday. Thank you for that. It really does make a difference in the lives of, uh, of people. Next week, um, Brian Houston's going to be here. He is the former pastor of uh, Hillsong, you know, all the music, all those kind of things. A lot of times we hear from folks when they're at the top of the game. And uh, Brian's been through a lot, and so I'm excited about hearing uh, from him. So next weekend, be sure and invite somebody. Uh, pastor Brian will be here uh, with us. Let me ask you a question. What is your dream? What is your dream? What, what is it that you think about? Maybe you get passionate about. Maybe you're excited about. Right? Because we all, we've all at least had them at one time in our lives. Where we thought in five years or in by next year, right? That, 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 that dream, that destiny, that sense of potential, that sense of purpose. I mean, what, what is yours? When's the last time you actually thought about it? Because you know what I've discovered is so many times people give up on their dream and they just start to kind of live life. You know what I mean? They get up and they go to work, they come home, they eat something, they watch Netflix, they go to bed, they get up, they come home, they watch Netflix, they go to bed, they get up, they go to work, and they come home. And every once in a while they get really excited about going on vacation. Right? In other words, somewhere along the way, they have settled for medium. They've settled for existing. Most of us, if we're not careful, that's exactly where we find ourselves. We, we give up on our dream. But let's think for just a moment. Let's even go back to when you were a kid. What was your dream? Did you dream of being a professional athlete? Or did you dream of being a ballerina or a police officer, a firefighter or an actor? I mean, you had some kind of dream, something you thought, wouldn't it be great? Or maybe even told your parents, one day, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be this. I'm going to experience this. Maybe even as you started to date somebody and you fell in love, you guys had a dream, a dream to have a family or a dream to have a child. Or, and, and what's your dream? And, and how's it going? How many of us have experienced our dream? How many of us feel that we're actually living out our destiny? You know, when I was in sixth grade. Sixth grade is the first year that I ever actually played basketball. We changed schools and they had basketball and they thought it would be good because um, in sixth grade I was decently uh, tall. And by seventh grade, I was dreaming of being able to dunk the basketball. And I put, you know, feet or I put sweat equity into that dream. You know, I jumped bleachers. I ran bleachers. I ordered anything on the back of comic books and then basketball magazines they'd have all these things that you could order so that you could jump higher funny shoes poems I don't know how a poem would help you jump but all of those posters and I mean I did all of that stuff so that I could one day be able to dunk a basketball that was my dream when I would sleep at night I would wake up because I'd be dreaming about dunking the basketball and then I would wake up and I'd think, have I dunked it? No? Oh, shoot. All right, let's go back. Let's go back to sleep. But eventually I got old enough and tall enough and I was able to dunk a basketball. But years ago, my mom gave me, I guess, what do you call it? Like a memory thing or whatever, where it's got all the articles from the newspapers and all that kind of thing from my senior year in high school. <laughs> it was only 40 years ago. And I, 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 my most memorable dunk is actually in one of these articles. I, I got to, for a moment, let me find it. Grambling steals the spotlight. No, that's not it. It says, CRA wins the Green County War. And so we were playing a team that was much larger. The school's much larger than us, and they slowed it down and tried to slow it down. And it says, unfortunately, this is from February the 10th, 1985. Ooh, doggies, that's a long time ago, right? Unfortunately for Tech Holder Spears, that's the coach of the opposing team, 
Holder's fears of Crowley's Ridge pulling away came true in the third quarter. After GCT's right netted a jumper from the lane, Curtis Dorch hit the front end of a one-and-one. CRA, that's the school I played for, pulled a play that almost turned the tide of the game by itself. Brent Trout brought the ball up court. He saw Grambling going toward the hoop, and then he lobbed the perfect alley-oop pass to Grambling, which he promptly slammed home. When Grambling got the dunk from Trout's pass, the kids really came to life. I'm sometimes amazed at the things Grambling does around the basket. Woo! <laughs> that dream came true for a moment, right? And it lives. <laughs> now, my kids had never thought it interesting enough to actually read any of those articles. Right? There's nothing like when a dream, when a dream comes true. You know, we've talked a lot about this book. This is just a copy of it. It hasn't come out yet. And my dream for this is because it, 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 it's not something I've ever felt comfortable doing. That's why it's taken me so long. My dream, first of all, of course, is the message. We're going to talk about that. This book is really about the people of God going from the promise or going from enslavement to the promised land. Going from where we are to the destiny or the purpose for which God has created us. That journey they take in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy is actually a road, a road map for us. And so my dream is that people will live their potential. I think the world can be changed. I think if we live our potential, God is best glorified when we become what he knitted us together in our mother's womb to become. But I'm also praying because Steph and I are not going to, of course, take any money from the book. We're giving it all to the, um, to the next generation for camp and the other things because I think our students need hope. And so I'm praying that enough will be sold that'll make a difference. That's my dream. Now, you know, I think it's like $2 or two something a book, so that means selling a lot of books. I, that's my dream. That's what I'm praying for. And then I'm dreaming that it would do well so that it would open the door for those who come behind to have opportunity. Because one success gives other people opportunities, whether it's to write a book or for the worship team to record an album or any of those kind of things. Those are my dreams. Are they going to come about? Are they going to happen? You know, not everything I've dreamed has turned out like my left-handed alley-oop slam dunk. I can read about it again if you'd like me to, all right? <laughs> Seven, I dreamed of starting a church in Little Rock a long time ago. And we moved and put our kids in new school and we did all of that. And that dream never happened. It was a, uh, a very sad ending to that dream. What about your dreams? I put this in your outline if you want to. It's on the app. If you're watching online, you can find it there as well. Because a dream is a journey. You don't just get a dream and then walk into it. You get a dream, right? And then you journey towards it. It's a process. And this is what I, I wrote down from my own experience and from the story we see in Scripture from the people of God. It says a journey to your dreams. It's a journey that will take longer than you thought it would. A journey to your dreams will cost more than you have. It's a journey that will hurt more than you expected. It's a journey that will be more difficult than you believe possible. It's a journey you will be tempted to quit. You say, well, why in the world would I want to go on it? Well, because it's a journey that will impact the world in ways you've never experienced. It's a journey that will take you closer to God than you've ever been. It's a journey that will fill you with more joy than you can imagine. And it's a journey that will grow your faith beyond your expectations. So here's the question, is will you go? Will you go on the journey? Will you go beyond just having a dream as we talked about on the Easter and your imagination? Will you step towards that? Will you begin to move towards that? I want us, as I do in the book, to just take a quick look at this journey that they take, the Israelites, from being enslaved to their promised land. And here's what I put in your outline. The journey begins for them in Genesis chapter 12. When God makes a promise to the founder, you might say, of the Israelites, Abraham, 
Look what it says. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, you're going to leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to a land I will show you. Every dream requires you and I to leave from where we are. I'm not talking necessarily physically like Abraham, but you're going to have to move off the chair that you're in. You're going to have to follow God. He says, I want you to leave. And then he says, I will make you. Here's the dream. Here's the destiny. Here's the potential that Abraham has. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others as well. Notice that the dream doesn't come from Abraham's desire. It comes from God. That's the kind of dream that we're talking about. I'm not necessarily just talking about dunking a basketball. I'm talking about that dream that God puts inside of your heart. That which God knit you together in order to accomplish. In other words, the dream is from God. And since God created you, he has pre-prepared you to accomplish that dream with gifts and talents. And you can know that that dream is from God because God gives us dreams that just aren't about ourselves. They're not just about what we can accomplish or what we can do. Notice it says, yes, God, Abraham, God's going to bless you. But this dream that God's given you is going to do what? It's going to bless, it says, others as well. It's bigger than you. It's about more than just you. What about you? What is your dream? Have you begun the journey? Are you pursuing it even as we talk? Whether you sit here in the house or you're watching online or in some other part of the world. Your circumstances, your environment don't have to limit the dream that God has put inside of your heart. But I will tell you this, as we learn from the Israelites, as at the moment you begin the dream, because it takes longer than you thought it was, right? Because when you have a dream, you're like, honey, guess what? We're going to start a business next week. Right? You know, and you've got it all planned out. You're going to go to the bank, and they're going to give you a loan. And Uncle Fred told you if you ever need anything, just give him a call. And so you call Uncle Fred, right? I mean, you've got it all planned out in your mind, but then it takes longer. The bank says, no, Uncle Fred died three months ago, you know? Because it takes longer, because it costs more. We, like the Israelites, say, God, I'm discouraged. That's exactly what happened to them. Look what it says in chapter 6 and verse 9, Moses comes, right? And he's telling them and he's telling Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. We're going into our destiny. We're going to reach our potential. It says, so Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord God had said, right? He gives them the dream. But they refused to listen. Why? Because they had become too discouraged. They just become too discouraged. When you get discouraged, you just don't even want to listen. Some of you are so discouraged that the mere idea of me talking about a dream kind of angers you. Because you're like, oh, I believed that before. I've read those books. I've done that. That's never going to happen. Right? You're just discouraged. You've given up on the dream. It feels like for every step forward, it's two steps back. When Steph and I came here 24 long years ago, they had already kind of organized this building here and they had went to the bank and they had planned it all out, but it hadn't been built yet. And then the team that was here, God called them on to something else and all of a sudden Steph and I are the pastors and we walk into this building after a year or so. Pretty amazing, right? To be able to go from the student building is where we were worshiping into this building. But this building costs a lot more than that building. This building, I just remember the utility bill was like $10,000 a month. Just for the utilities of this building. But when we came into this building, guess what didn't change? The giving didn't change. And so all but we had a much nicer building, a much larger building, and with it came lots of opportunity. It didn't take long for us to be like $700,000 in the red. In other words, it seems like for every step forward, there was two step backwards and you just get discouraged. God, I'm doing everything I know to do. Why isn't it working? Why is it taking so long? Why does it cost so much? 
And what's God's response today to your discouragement about your dream? We, we want it to be for God to feel sorry for us, don't we? I know it's tough, honey. It, it's, 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 I know it's not fair. We want God to supernaturally just kind of zap us with some kind of success. We want God to agree with us that it's unfair. That's what we want God's response to be. But what is God's response to the Israelites and to us today? It's keep going. Don't give up. It's really that simple. Keep going. Don't give up. Look what he says in verse 10. Moses goes to him and says, we're going to the promised land. And they're like, shut up. We don't want to hear that. We're just too discouraged. And so Moses goes to God and he's like, God, what am I going to do? And what does God say? Then the Lord said to Moses, you go back to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and you tell him to let my people go. What was God's answer? He would say, Moses, I don't care what you're feeling. You keep going. Do not quit. Don't allow your discouragement to get you down. I, after COVID, COVID was incredibly discouraging. I can't tell you how discouraging it was to come and to speak to the camera. And I'm glad that many of you were on the other side of the camera, but we put pictures of you on these chairs because it just got so lonely. And then we started back really quite early. And I'm like, whoa, it's going to be so much good. But you know what? <laughs> you didn't come back. A year later, a year, 18 months later, only 40% of you came back. In other words, the journey of starting over has been incredibly discouraging. And you know what goes through your mind? Because I can tell you, COVID was just so draining. I'm sure for you as well. We were doing stuff online every day and we're trying to minister and care for people and just it's, it's, it's stressful draining for all of us and so when you didn't come back you know what you know what my skin told me Troy, just take a break you 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 deserve it just 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 kind of quit but don't quit just kind of go through the motions and I'm sure that there are some of us here today that are discouraged and everything inside of you wants to quit you want me to tell you that it's not fair and yet the scripture is reminding us that anybody and everybody that pursues a dream a destiny that runs after their potential along the way is going to get discouraged and God's message is not that he doesn't care but keep going because what I promised you I would do I'm still going to do he says you go tell Pharaoh let my people go and wouldn't it be awesome that after discouragement you just kind of walked right into your promise you walked right into your destiny you were able to have children you found mr. and mrs. Wright. the company got started the church began to grow but that's not what happened to the Israelites they go from God I'm discouraged to God I'm afraid God, I, I'm afraid I, 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 don't, I don't know what's going to happen. The Israelites find themselves, this is after the plagues, because we don't have time, there's a lot there, but after the plagues, and finally Pharaoh says, all right, get out of here, let my people go. And so they're on their way to the destiny, to their promised land, and they come up against the Red Sea, and about that time, Pharaoh's like, what was I thinking? Who's going to build the pyramids? Who's going to plant the crops? Let's go get them. And so the Israelites have the Red Sea in front of them, and they have Pharaoh and his army, which happened to be the most powerful army in the world at the time, pursuing them. Look what the scripture says in Exodus 14. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked. They saw the Egyptians overtaking them, and they cried out to the Lord and to Moses, didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We told you, Moses, just leave us alone. But no. Oh, you ever feel like that? I, I told you the bank would say no, but no, you had me to fill it out. You had us to invest everything we've got. I told you we shouldn't move, but we, you had to move, right? Whoever you is. 
Sometimes you as God, sometimes you as our spouse, sometimes it's a friend, a business partner. And really, we're just afraid. Afraid that we're not going to find a bank. Afraid that the ministry's never going to grow. I remember for me, after months uh, with COVID, it was like, are people ever going to come back? I, I, the first time we had service, like right after COVID and they closed everything down and they told us that, you know, we could do it online, but we could only have 10 people. And the police showed up to make sure we only had 10. And my whole life, I had never been afraid of the government of the country in which I live. I changed that. And maybe you're here and you're afraid because of what the doctors told you about having children. You're afraid that whatever it is that you see is just too big to deal with. So what's God's response? Well, what do we want God's response to be? It's all going to be okay. Just go on back to Egypt. We'll try again later. Just go, go, just go ahead. You're right. I'm telling you, that's just too big. The odds are just too against you. It just seems to be too impossible. Just, just settle down and go back. But is that God's response? No, it's very similar to his response when we get discouraged. Look at what he tells them in verse 15. Right? The people are freaking out because they see the Egyptians, this powerful army marching towards them. And so God goes, Moses goes to God and says, God, what are we going to do? And listen to God. God says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to what? Get moving. Don't quit. Don't surrender. Don't stop pursuing your dream. God is reminding us, it's not that God is surprised by our circumstances. God's not surprised that the Egyptian army is coming after you and the Red Sea is in front of you. He's not surprised the bank said no. He's not surprised that the doctor gave you this prognosis. He's not surprised that you haven't had children yet. He's not surprised that you haven't found Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright yet. God is not surprised by our circumstances. And he says to us the same thing. Go, continue to pursue the dream that I put into your heart and that I pre-prepared you to accomplish. I'm still on the throne. I'm still the king of kings. God is not surprised, even though you and I might be afraid that we don't have enough money or that we don't know enough or that we don't have enough. And maybe you're like, you know what? I've been discouraged, but I didn't quit. And I've had to face some things that are really quite scary. Because God's not saying the Egyptian army's not scary. He's just saying, I can handle it. And you say, I, 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 I didn't give up. I didn't quit. Wouldn't it be nice then that you just kind of walk into your destiny? Woo! We have arrived. But that's not what happened to them. They said, God, I'm discouraged. Feel sorry for me. God says, no, go. Don't give up. Don't quit. God, I'm afraid. Go. And then they said, God, it hurts. It hurts. Sometimes it hurts emotionally, doesn't it? Sometimes it hurts mentally. Sometimes it hurts physically. It's just painful. Difficult to even move toward. How can you pursue your dream when what has happened hurt so much. The folks that people stabbed you in the back, that they've wrote things about you online and it's hurt your business. And it hurts. You can't believe that that person would do that to you. In the midst of all of that now, you're dealing with the news the doctor gave you. Steph and I never planned on being the pastors here, but when they made us the, 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 the pastors, right? Well, not everybody, of course, has the same dream, and so people leave. And I can remember when we were over in that building, and I'd come one weekend, and whole connect groups of people would leave and go to the church down the road, and that always hurts. People always dismiss it by saying, oh, they don't care, they just blah, 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 but it always hurts. It always feels painful. 
It always makes you want to give up or surrender. I know you know the feeling. You've had people do that to you. People that you trusted, people that you love, some that may be even really close to you that promised you that they were going to be there and yet they said, I do, but they didn't. And they walked away. And just like it just hurts too much. And then it seems on top of that, you get into an accident. The kids get sick. You know, I, I went to the... Um, to get an MRI the other day. And when they, I went to the doctor, the doctor said, I have five herniated discs in my neck and six herniated discs in my back. I mean, I could, I could probably quit and get government money, all right? It's, uh, life hurts. And when life hurts, what do we want to do? We just want to sometimes give up. Right, well, what is, God's, what is God's response to them? Because look at what they say in chapter 16. Let's see their pain. It says, the whole company of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron there in the wilderness. They said, why didn't God let us die in comfort in Egypt? And you're like, well, you were in slavery in Egypt. Yeah, but this is more difficult. Now, you may not have liked going to the job that you had, but it was easier going to a job you hated than trying to start a company that's where they are. They're like, why? Why? We, we at least had lamb stew and we had all the carbs we could eat. You brought us out of the wilderness. We're just going to starve to death. It hurts. We want God to say, it's okay. It's unfair. Just quit. Stop the pain. You have a right not to hurt. Go back. Go back to that other job. Go back to your hometown. Go back to what? Just stop. Give up. But what is God's response? God's response is that my grace is sufficient. Don't quit today. Don't quit today. Just don't give up today. Look what he says in verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, look. Because they're complaining, right? They're hungry and they're like, man, we'd rather be enslaved than go through this pain. He says, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. And then what does it say? Each day. In other words, God tells them, I'm going to take care of you today. And the people can go out and they can pick up as much food as they need. What? For that day. He's saying, my grace is sufficient for today. I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. What God's saying, I'm going to see whether or not you can trust me for today. Just don't quit today. That's God's message. It's not that what you're going through doesn't hurt, that it's not painful, that it's not unjust or unfair. God's message to you and I is just don't quit today. Don't give up in this moment. And I got good news for you. You are here. And you know what that means? It means you didn't quit yesterday and you haven't quit yet today. God's grace is sufficient for the moment. That's all you and I have to do as we walk through sometimes the pain that is involved in pursuing our destiny or our dream or our potential. But some of them didn't listen. Look what it says in Exodus 16, 20. It says, but some of them didn't listen. And they're like, oh my gosh, I know we've got some today, but what about tomorrow? Right, because that's what some of us have been worrying about. I mean, I, I mean, I know I've made it today, Troy. Woo, that sounds really good, but Monday's when the payment's due. And you've missed today because you're worried about tomorrow. Makes sense. Right, I mean, I know the kids in, in five years are going to go off to college and you're kind of worried that's exactly what happened to them. It says some of them didn't listen and they kept some of it until the morning. They're like, well, what if it doesn't come in the morning? It says, but then what they kept was what? Full of maggots and had a terrible smell. And, and Moses was angry because he's like, why, why didn't you trust that God's grace was sufficient? Don't we tend to do the same things? In other words, you can't participate in today because you're hanging on so tightly because you're worried about tomorrow. Well, what's going to happen tomorrow? That, that's exactly where they were. And so Jesus responds in the New Testament to you and I. And these are the words of Jesus himself in Matthew 6. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. 
live righteously, and he will give you everything what? You need. What is he saying? My grace is sufficient for you today. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. What's God asking you to do right now? God's sustaining you right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. God says, I can take care of tomorrow. Just trust me in the moment. And sometimes when you're in incredible pain, that's all the faith that you have is for the moment. I'm not quitting today. I'm not quitting in this hour. I don't know about next hour. I'm not going to worry about next hour. I'm just not going to quit in this hour. I'm just going to take one more step towards my destiny. I don't know what the future is going to hold, but there's one thing I'm sure of. In this moment, I'm not giving up. In this moment, I am not going to quit. And oh man, I made it through discouragement. I made it through my fear. I made it most of all through the pain, emotionally and physically. I haven't given up. I haven't quit. Isn't it? Isn't it time to experience my potential or my destiny or my purpose? It wasn't for them. Because the next thing they said is, God, this is, this is too hard. Week after week, month after month, I'm just tired. This is too hard. Look at what they say in Numbers chapter 11. It says, Moses heard all the family standing in the doorways of their tents whining. And Moses says to the Lord, God, why are you treating me like this? Why it, it, it so harshly? What's he saying? Say, God, why does this got to be so hard? And then we compare ourselves, don't we? Doesn't seem hard for that church. Doesn't seem hard for that business. Doesn't seem hard for that husband or that wife or that single person or that have mercy on me, God. What did I do to deserve the burden of all these people? Did I give birth to them? Did I bring them into the world? God, this is your dream. You put it in me. You've given me the passion. Why'd you tell me to carry them in my arms like a mother carries a nursing baby? How can I carry them to the land you swore? How are we ever going to get to our destiny, to our potential? And then he says it, doesn't he? He says, the load. it's just too heavy. It's just too hard, God. And what do we want God's response to be in that moment? Because sometimes we can embrace the challenge, can't we? It's just so hard. And we just want God to feel sorry for us. We want God to admit that it's not fair. We want God to encourage us by telling us that we're the best. But what's God's response to Moses? His response was, humble yourself. Ask for help and don't quit. Humble yourself. Most remember, this is, this is not all about you. I'm going to bless the world is the promise that God makes in Genesis. Through you. This is bigger than you, Moses. Look what it says in verses 16 and 17. The Lord said to Moses, gather before me 70 men who are elders, and bring them to the tabernacle to stand there with you. And I will come down, and I will talk to you there, Moses, and I will take some of the spirit that is upon you, and I will put that spirit upon them also. That, that's the part we don't want, isn't it? Right? That's where the humility comes. He says, then they will bear the burden of the people along with you, so you will not have to carry it alone. But if I don't carry it all by myself then nobody's going to feel sorry for me. Nobody's going to admit how much I've overcome. See, sometimes the problem is that we just won't humble ourselves enough to ask for help. Some of us are pursuing our destiny, and we just need to humble us, ourselves enough to ask our wife for help, to admit that we're hurting, that we're discouraged, that we're afraid. Maybe we need to ask our kids for help. Maybe we need to ask some of the folks that we do life and ministry with for help. Maybe we need to ask an extended family member for help. But that means that you're going to have to humble yourself enough and admit you can't do it alone. You're not the greatest CEO that's ever lived. 
You're not the smartest person that's ever been born. You're not the physically strongest person that's ever been known. You don't have it all together. You need somebody. He says, humble yourself, Moses, and ask for help. But whatever you do, don't quit. Don't quit. I'm still on my throne, and I will keep my promises. And then lastly, God, I'm discouraged. God, it's too hard. God, I'm afraid. God, it hurts. And then maybe you can agree with them, because the next thing they say is, God, I'm never going to get there. I quit. It's never going to happen. Because they are on the verge. They are right here. They can see the promised land. And so they send spies in. And the problem is they're giants. There's walled cities like Jericho. And so look at what they say in Numbers 14. The whole community began weeping aloud. And they cried all night. And then they plotted among themselves. They said, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. What were they saying? We quit. We kept going when we were afraid, when we were discouraged. We kept pursuing it when it was painful, but we're done. I quit. I'm giving up. And you know what I've noticed is in life, we can quit and remain married. We can quit and still sit in a church chair. We can quit and still get up and go to work every day. They said, we quit. We're done with this. And what was God's response? Well, we want God's response to be, no, you can't quit. You're too important. I mean, I've got all this invested in you. You can't quit on your marriage. You can't quit on having children. You can't quit on starting that business. You can't quit on changing the world. You can't quit on beginning that ministry or growing that church. But what is God's response? It's okay. You're free to choose. It's your choice. You have a free will. But if you quit, you're never going to live your dream. If you quit, you're never going to reach your potential. Look, this is God in verse 21. God says, but as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will ever enter that land. They will not experience their dream or their destiny or their potential. They've all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have have been refusing to even listen to me. They will never see the land I swore to their ancestors. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. And we too have seen God do things in our lives over and over and over again. And yet, you've given up on the hope that God will accomplish the dream in your heart. You say, oh, Troy, I've never seen any miracles. No, no, I know that you've experienced them. And the reason I know that is because the Bible tells me you have an adversary. And that this adversary goes to and fro looking for opportunities to steal, kill, and destroy. And the only reason that you're here today is because God has miraculously acted upon your behalf so that you one day could walk into your promised land. He says, you're never going to see it because you quit. And when they realize <laughs> they can't manipulate God, because I think that's what they were trying to do. Well, God, we're just going to quit. You ever do that? Try to get somebody to do what you want? Well, I guess we just won't go. Oh, Dad, we'll do it, right? When they realize they can't manipulate God, they change their mind. They're like, oh, we're going to go. We're just kidding, God. I'm not going to quit. And Moses says, it's too late. It's too late. Like, no, no, it's not. Look what happens in verse 40. It says, then they got up early the next morning. And they went to the top of the hill. And they said, let's go. <sighs> I'm refreshed. We realize that we have sinned. But now we're ready to enter the land the Lord has promised us. And Moses is like, no, no, it's too late. But they didn't listen. And the people defiantly pushed ahead toward the hill country. They didn't have Moses, they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant, and the Canaanites and the Amicites pushed them back. And they never went in. They missed their dream. 
The Bible tells us in Exodus 12 that 600,000 men left Egypt when Pharaoh said, get out of here. And the, the Bible tells us that all of them that were over the age of 20 died wandering in the wilderness because they quit, except for two. That's scary, isn't it? I mean, maybe some of those men were less than, you know, uh, 20, so maybe it wasn't quite 600,000. But literally, out of hundreds of thousands of people, only two lived their dream. The, I, I have experienced that in all these years of ministry because you get to see people's dreams. You get to hear them. People tell you all the things they're going to do and ask you to pray for them. People talk about their spiritual lives. They talk about their personal lives. They talk about their generosity. They talk about all of these things that they're going to do and that they've been doing for a few weeks. Only two. Why? Did God like them better? Were they more spiritual? Did they know more? Did they pray more? Did they read their Bible more? The Bible tells us there's only one thing that was different between these two and hundreds of thousands of other men. They didn't quit. Look, in verses 11 and 12 of Numbers 32, God again is saying, they'll never get in. None of those who came up out of Egypt who were 20 years and older will ever see their dream, will ever enter into their destiny, experience their potential. They're never going to see the land I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because they weren't interested in following me. Their hearts weren't in it. They didn't persevere. They quit. God's not saying it wasn't hard. God's not saying there weren't things to be afraid of. God's just saying they quit. Except for Caleb and Joshua. Now what did Caleb and Joshua do? They followed me. Their hearts were in it. They did not quit. I know that seems really simple. There's no big strategy here. There's nothing for me to sell to you. The reality is that if you want to experience the dream that God has put inside of your heart, there's only one thing you've got to do, and that is not quit. Continue to persevere. In the New Testament, the book of Galatians says, so let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good, because at the right time, we will harvest a good crop if what? if we do not give up and quit. And I just want to say to you, whether you're sitting here in the house or you're watching there online, don't quit. I know it's painful, and I know it's scary, and I know it's hard, and I know it's taken a really long time, and I know everything inside of you wonders whether you're ever going to get there. But the one thing you have power over is not to quit, not to give up, not to surrender that the God who rose from the grave has promised that he will bring about in your life what he created you to accomplish. Just don't quit. Just don't quit. Don't quit. Keep your heart as painful as it is in the dream that God's put there. Don't just go through the motions. Don't stay married, but quit. Don't keep going to work, but quit. Stay in the dream. Would you bow your head? We were all unique. But just like Abraham, God gives all of us a dream. We are all made, knit together. Jeremiah says, God, you, you created me to, to be a prophet. <laughs> he had a difficult journey in which to go. But his destiny had incredible impact, as will yours. Don't quit. Don't give up. I know it's hard. God created the church, as imperfect as we are, to inspire, to encourage, to teach, to challenge, to love one another. That's why he says that we're not to give up on attending or being a part because we need it so we don't give up. Father, I thank you for these folks. 
And I thank you for the dreams that are in the hearts of the folks that are in the house and those who are watching online today. God, sometimes it's so hard not to quit. It's so hard not to take the path backwards. It seems that what you've asked us to do is impossible. We wonder whether it will ever happen. And yet today, once again, we learn from your people. We are blessed by their story. We will not quit. We will not give up. Faith is the confidence, according to Hebrews 11, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. Not because we're good, but because you are great. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.